Hello, welcome to my talk for the summer AAPT virtual meeting. My name is Dan Burns. I'm the physics curriculum and training specialist at Pasco Scientific. Uh, that's my email. Feel free to contact me uh, with any questions about this or anything related to physics. My main uh, job description is uh, helping physics teachers. Uh, this is my agenda. Uh, we're going to focus on uh, the motion of a chain that's draped over a pulley, and we will look at the experimental setup, theoretical derivation, numerical simulation of it, and compare the results. And then a separate problem is dropping that chain uh, and measuring and predicting the force on a force sensor, and then we'll look at some resources and references. All my resources, including these slides, are at this URL. And so uh, tiny URL pasco-aapt-s20. And so I have two different uh, experimental setups for the chain over a pulley. Uh, I'm using the beaded chain over a super pulley. And we're measuring the motion of the super pulley with a photo gate. Sometimes people call this a smart pulley when you combine the two. So the photo gate's just measuring the change in time between spokes, and then you can turn that into a linear velocity and linear position data, which is what we're going to do. Then I also wanted to try it. Oh, here's a video of it. <clears throat> and so we're going to model the motion before that last part there. That might be the subject of my talk next summer. And so while the chain is still on the pulley, we want to solve for velocity as a function of position. I also wanted to try it with our rotary motion sensor, which is uh, easier to set up. This isn't too bad, but it has a little bit more rotational inertia and friction in it. And so I found this chain at a craft store that's got about twice the linear density of the beaded chain. And it fit in the pulley just fine. And so this would work for a lot of your uh, chain experiments. And so uh, uh, both of those methods work. And any photo gates and pulleys you have or rotary motion sensors should work for the experimental part of this. Not going to spend a lot of time on the derivation here. This is a classic physics problem what we've done is drawn a free body diagram of the chain on the right side and the chain on the left side we're ignoring the little bit of chain on top of the pulley um, i do include that in numerical simulation and it can be neglected if you have a long enough chain uh, and so we're going to calculate the work done which would be the integral of the net force force with respect to x so the weight on the right side is doing positive work as it falls, and the tensions are uh, each do, one doing positive, one doing negative work, and then the weight on the left side is doing negative work because it's in the opposite direction of motion. And so you write all that out, and then you have some algebra to do to simplify that. So that's all we're doing there is algebra. I haven't done any calculus until we get to... Um, this last part here and so that's it simplified you could factor the m out too if you wanted but notice we have two constant terms and an x term so when we integrated that we had an x term here and an x term here and then this becomes x squared over two and so i set that equal to the change in kinetic energy and since the initial velocity is zero that's just one half mv squared and i get an equation that'll tell me the speed as a function of uh, how far the chain has fall distance x. We can simplify that further, and I want to do that by balancing the chain to start with and just having the right side have a tiny, tiny bit more, uh, and so it would start to fall. So its initial x naught would be half the length of the chain. And so if you do that, you get a linear relationship between the speed and the position and the slope would be a square root of 2gl. So it makes it kind of neat for comparing the uh, experimental to the theoretical. And so for the 1.5 meter, uh, meter beaded chain, I'm predicting a slope of 3.56. And I'll show you the measurements, but it comes out pretty close. Now, if your students are in calculus, you can do this using a numerical simulation. 
And so we're doing the same thing. We're going to solve for the net force, but instead of integrating it then, we're going to multiply by a tiny time step and solve for the change in momentum. And then the change in velocity, we could solve for using the change in momentum, and we could get the position as well, and then increment time and repeat. And so if we use a small enough change in time, this works. We're assuming the net force doesn't change much during this small change in time. And so this is on the previous slide. We're just getting the net force again. And so that would be the difficult part for students with some guidance, which I provide in the student lab handout for this. They could figure that out. And then the change, this is our little algorithm here. And what I'm going to do is write this up in the Pasco Capstone software, the same software we're using to take the experimental data. So they have their code they wrote using Blockly to predict what's happening, and they can compare it directly with what they measured experimentally. Uh, Blockly is also integrated into our SparkView software, which is free for tablets and phones. And right now, if you have desktops and laptops, SparkView and Capstone, it has a 180-day free trial for those. So here's the Blockly code. We don't really need to spend much time on that, but it's it's provided. Uh, so you can go over and check it. Maybe you can come up with a better way of doing it. But you can see the outputs are velocity and position and time from the code. Well, how well did it work? Well, this is the code output, velocity versus position. Nicely linear. And the slope 3.57 compares very well with the theoretical slope 3.56. I uh, accounted for the tiny bit of chain on top of the pulley in the code. And so I was interested in that. So it is slightly different because of that. And then the experimental data, the slope comes out to 3.36, still very nicely linear until that chain flew off there at the end. Uh, so I was very happy with that comparison, just a 5.9% difference. What about the heavier chain on the rotary motion sensor? Well, I only used one meter, so I'm predicting a different slope. And it uh, came out to 4.05, so bigger percent difference. It didn't surprise me, but still pretty good. Uh, maybe try longer chains. That'd be an interesting experiment is have different length chains for each group. Now, am I going to have time to go through the falling chain experiment? Uh, no way. Uh, so I have a separate video. Uh, this was one of my uh, pandemic lockdown projects, and so I've had that posted there for a while, and so you can just get to it from this YouTube link. And so all I'm doing is dropping a chain onto a force sensor, and if you release the chain so it's just about to hit the force sensor, the maximum force just before the last bit falls is three times its weight, which is pretty cool. And so this black line is a numerical simulation using Blockly, very similar to what we just did. And the red line is measured by the force sensor. So it does come out pretty good. So I recommend you check that out. And so I did write uh, a lab for the chain on a pulley and a teacher guide for it. And for the falling chain and a teacher guide and that, the Blockly code, the capstone files, and a copy of the references, some of the references, is all at this tiny URL. And so that would be the key thing to uh, write down and get access to everything I've talked about. And there's my references. A uh, special thank you to Paul Beacon, who worked with me on this whole project back and forth uh, and his excellent article um, where he looks at it with masses on the chain <coughs> in the Physics Teacher magazine. And so thanks for joining me. Let me know if you have any questions and enjoy the rest of your virtual AAPT uh, summer meeting.